do need to go through the process of making sure everybody can hear and be heard. Right. So why don't you just call the, the finance committee to order and not do that. And then I'll do the council, which will include everybody. And then I'll do the additional people. Okay. Okay. Lynn, when you're ready, you can cue Amherst Media. And I'm doing that by doing what? Recording? <laughs> by saying we're ready. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Amherst Media, we're ready. Go ahead, Andy. Okay. Andy? Okay. Good evening. It's uh, 6.30 p.m. And it's uh, June 8th of 2020. And uh, I'm going to, in a moment, call the Finance Committee to order. Um, what is happening this evening is that the um, char town charter requires that the Finance Committee hold hearings on any budget that is going to be considered. And this is a public hearing for two Actually, it's two different public hearings for two different budgets. The first one is the budget for the regional school district. And uh, after we call the, to the committee and the council to order, um, we will uh, then proceed to the hearing and I'll explain the hearing process. But I'm now, uh, my name is Andrew Steinberg. I'm the uh, chair of the finance committee and I'm going to turn uh, uh, this over for a moment to the council president, Lynn Griesmer, who's going to call the, uh, to order the council. Okay. Um, given that we have a quorum of the Amherst Town Council, I am calling the council to order at 631. We're going to now go through the process of making sure you can hear us and we can hear you. And if at any time during the process we have difficulty, we will either stop the meeting or make note that somebody has not been able to continue. So um, I'm not going to do this in particular order, but in order of my screen. Andy Steinberg, can you hear me? Yes. Lynn Griesmer, yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. Sarah Schwartz? Yes. Darcy Dumont? Darcy, can you unmute and confirm you can hear us? Yes, I hear you. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Yes. Mandy Jo Haneke? Yes. Okay, and then in addition to that, we have two people. Two more. Three people. I missed two counselors. Ah, Shalini Balmilm, and can you hear me? Yes. And Evan Ross. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and then we, in addition to that, we have three members who are non-voting resident members of the uh, Finance Committee, uh, Bob Hegner. Yes. <coughs> Aaron Povinelli. You yes. Need to Thank yes. You. Okay, and Mary Lou Tileman. Yes. Okay, and then since we have the school people starting first, I want to make sure that Mike Morris can hear us. Yeah. Thank you, Superintendent. Doug Slaughter. Yes, I can. Okay, and I saw you earlier. Where are you? Allison McDonald. Yes. Thank you. All right, Andy, why don't you start? <clears throat> uh, well, first of all, I want to remind everyone that pursuant to governor's, um, Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 30A, section 18, uh, this meeting, which is a joint meeting of the uh, council and the finance committee, um, is being conducted uh, via remote participation. And um, Having said that, and I think um, I had, um, we're convening now the meeting of the Finance Committee, in addition to having already convened the meeting of the Council. Um, so this is the first of two budget hearings, as I just explained. Uh, 
The hearing is required by Section 5.5 of the Amherst Home Rule Charter and uh, is pursuant to Council Rules of Procedure Rule 5.2. Uh, we are going to first have the hearing of the uh, regarding the regional school budget. And so this is the process that I'm going to um, proceed by, um, which is consistent with Rule 5.2. It generally follows the outline, but um, there is the provision in the rule for making appropriate modifications for um, budget hearings, which is what this is. Um, and uh, so we're going to start with a presentation um, of the budget by the superintendent of schools with the um, participation of staff that he's going to introduce to us and the chair of the uh, regional school committee um, who uh, he can also introduce to us. After his presentation, um, I'm going to then open it up first to council members and members of the finance committee, all eight members of the finance committee. Um, of course, five are also council members. And I'm going to uh, try and recognize um, from the council members and finance committee in order that I see hands going up in the uh, raise hand function. And uh, after um, questions from the uh, council and finance committee, um, we then open it up to any public attendees who wish to either ask questions or make comments regarding the budget. Um, at, the at the conclusion of that portion, if any other council members have any other comments to make after having heard from members of the public, um, or um, we'll entertain any final comments and that will conclude the first hearing. And then we will proceed to the second hearing um, unless it is not yet seven o'clock, at which point we will have to recess because the second meeting, which is regarding the town manager's proposed July budget for the um, town, which is a one month budget, uh, is a separate hearing that was posted for 30 minutes after this one. So with that introduction, um, I want to welcome our superintendent, uh, Mike Morris, and uh, Superintendent Morris, um, uh, you please uh, make a presentation and tell us a little bit uh, about the budget that uh, you're asking the council and its finance committee to consider. Sure. So first, I just want to acknowledge um, Chair McDonald, who's with us today. So thank you for coming on the call. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over, uh, and I'm conscious of the time constraint that, that um, Councillor Steinberg mentioned, so I'll try to be brief in my comments, as will Dr. Slaughter, because we know there's other things on your agenda this evening. Um, so the regional school budget was passed in March uh, and repatched, repassed again uh, in late May. And uh, because of the situation with COVID and the financial implications, it meant cutting a couple hundred thousand dollars from our budget. And uh, it's a particularly hard time of year. If you watch any show, Johns Hopkins had a really good presentation recently. Uh, ASBO, which is the National Association of School Business Managers uh, or School Business Officials, as well as my professional organization, came out with a budget report today that suggested that uh, doing school next year will be more expensive, not less expensive, uh, given all the CDC precautions. Um, there was a very lengthy presentation last week. So if anyone's curious about what that looks like, please, I encourage you to, to watch the joint school committee meeting that was last Wednesday night or go to our website, which has the presentation from that. And so what we tried to do is we knew that reducing staff was not going to be a viable strategy because we're going to need all hands on deck to make some sort of schooling uh, work given the CDC requirements. And so you will not see many reductions in staffing. And that's um, certainly we, we value our staff and, and that's part of it. But the other part of it is in order to have school function next year, we need as many staff as we can possibly have. And so it put us in a somewhat precarious situation. We think we've drafted a budget that, uh, well, we know we drafted a budget that met, met the guidelines that was expressed. It's, it's, um, it, it's a challenging budget. It's one that we think can be fiscally responsible uh, and hopefully be implemented with fidelity next year. Uh, the other thing I want to be really clear about is, is to, or to be unclear about is we don't know what school will look like. 
right? That, that presentation last week was the beginning of a conversation. We have a survey out with over 700 responses right now from staff and, and families about what school might look like given the CDC requirements. Uh, some of the questions you all have tonight will probably be great questions that are unanswerable, unanswerable excuse me, uh, because at this point, DESE has not yet to even release its guidance. Um, that won't come out till next week on uh, what it's recommending, let alone what we're able to do. So we are in a very difficult situation as it relates to opening school. We know how critical it is for students and frankly for the community uh, that we're able to open school uh, for as many kids as possible next year. We know the long-term consequences of not doing this well. And, and with that, uh, that's where we, we find ourselves as we come to, the, um, to, to this budget. So we, we did have uh, school, unanimous school committee support in passing it. I think the last thing I'll suggest before I turn it over to Dr. Slaughter is how incredibly challenging this is for everyone, for staff members, administrators. Uh, we're essentially trying to recreate what school looks like with wildly different rules. Um, and it's upended what we think of as education. Uh, it's, we've had to incur significant costs in different places because of that. And the uncertainty is very hard. We talk, you know, superintendents come to town councils every year. And we talk about what changes and, and, you know, to us and to educators, it feels like large changes. I know to members of the public, it could be uh, perhaps feel like smaller changes. This is significant second order change uh, that we're talking about and, and first order change and second order change and third order change. It's really resetting what education is. And so I think some of the uncertainty that may be felt in some of the responses because we're still trying to engage the community to make the best choices, uh, in this case for the four towns, as well as for the Amherst, uh, I'll speak to Amherst, but there's a regional budget, uh, of how to put together an educational program that's gonna be most effective for students, given the CDC requirements. Again, because of time, I won't go into them. That may be interesting to you, but you know, went to them ad nauseum, uh, so to speak, in a very long meeting last uh, Wednesday night that people can watch. So with all that, uh, those caveats and that uh, context setting, I'll turn it over to Dr. Slaughter, who has a brief presentation before we open up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, I'll begin and uh, I'll share my screen here. Hopefully I can do this without much issue, just to sort of take you through uh, <clears throat> a few slides that I've uh, prepared that you've gotten. And so hopefully everyone can see this without issue. Uh, this is a new slide that, that was uh, put into your packet uh, this afternoon, I believe. Um, and I thought I'd start with this because it, it, uh, it helps to sort of frame where, where we normally are as far as the budget process and things we may need to uh, encounter relative to our budget process. So to start with, you know, in, in normal circumstances with the regional school uh, uh, budget, what happens is that the regional school committee goes ahead and adopts and recommends, an, uh, adopts a budget and recommends an assessment method. Then those go to the council and the town meetings of the, of the uh, three other communities. And three of the four towns must adopt the, bot, the budget in order for it to be adopted. Uh, but given that we use an alternative assessment method, every single uh, uh, town must accept the alternative uh, assessment method in order for us to have a full budget. Um, and so that hasn't changed. That has been the, the status quo for us for a number of years. If we are to amend the budget during the fiscal year, which very well, given the unknowns that we have, could, could occur, um, I thought I'd just share with you some of the things that would happen process-wise for us uh, regarding that amendment process. So first order, uh, or first thing that has to happen is uh, uh, any budget decrease or reduction in assessment amounts only requires um, the regional school committee to approve of those changes. So anything that reduces the burden on, the, on any of the member communities uh, or reduces the overall expenditure of the district is allowed by, by regional school committee vote um, it is a two-thirds majority required in that circumstance, but, <clears throat> but it doesn't requ require action by the, the uh, appropriating authorities in the communities, which is uh, town council in Amherst and, the, and, and town meeting in the, in the other three towns. If the budget itself increases, and so uh, the regional school committee recognizes that we need to increase the expenditure level of, of, the, of the budget, three of the four towns need to, uh, need to agree to that even if the assessed amounts don't change. So if, if for some reason we have uh, additional state aid than what we expect and uh, we wish to expend that for the purposes of uh, you know, the programming in our schools for, that, for the coming fiscal year, uh, we can do that, but it still requires uh, three of the four communities to say yes to that. Um, likewise, if, 
and, and maybe more importantly, if we have a change such that the assessment to a given town or all four towns needs to increase, any town whose assessment changes uh, or, or needs an increase must approve that change. Um, so we may have a, a budget that stays flat, but we need to assess more of the communities. If one of the community's uh, assessment changes and the others don't, that one community would have to, to approve that assessment. Now, the way our assessment method works, uh, the recommended assessment method works, uh, if one town's assessment changes, they all change. So it, it, it could be an, an interesting circumstance. But if uh, the assumptions we have regarding minimum contributions that communities have to make changes uh, after we've sort of set this budget, uh, it could be a, an odd circumstance where an individual community might have an assessment amount change, um, and, and then they would have to go back to town meeting and, and vote on that. Um, at the bottom of the slide, I, I placed a, a little bit of context from a history standpoint on Amherst, uh, you know, assessment over the last few years. Uh, these are the budgeted numbers. And then likewise, the, uh, the overall budget for the regional school district. Uh, and these again are based on budget numbers. As we go to the next slide, you'll see uh, when we put some actuals in there for fiscal 18 and 19, those, those uh, percentages from the previous year change a little bit based on, on uh, the, the actuals of, of the year. Um, but what you see in that, in that slide is that you know, we've, we've held the, the percentage change in assessment to Amherst uh, within the, the guidance of the uh, Finance Committee over the last few years. Um, but that often doesn't match or mirror what happens to the budget as a whole. And so the budget as a whole uh, typically goes up a much smaller amount um, year over year than, than you might expect relative to a particular school's assess or town's assessment. Um, and that assessment's, you know, as, as you may or may not know, it's a fairly complex uh, calculation. It's based on a variety of factors the way we do it, uh, one of which is how many kids are, are, are from immersed in uh, the school district, but also based on a, a, a factor of, of ability to pay based on what's called EQV, um, which has to do with um, a wage factor, in other words, income basis, as well as the uh, property values within the community. So it's, it's a fairly complex uh, calculation that's involved in, in calculating those assessments. And so it, it, it doesn't track smoothly necessarily, although we try to put in, and the assessment method we try to pick is, is one to mitigate the large spikes, both positive and negative, to any given community within the, within the region. Slide to the next slide. So on this page, so we, we generally start from a, from a standpoint of a, a level services budget, um, and then we calculate as best we can, given that we usually do this in the fall, uh, and you know, we're only about a quarter of the way into a fiscal year, we're trying to project our, our level services for the, for the coming year. Uh, and then we take a look at our resources and, and get some guidance from, from the various towns about their ability, uh, given their projections for revenue, what they might be able to pay. Um, and we recognized even uh, before the COVID crisis uh, that we were going to have to uh, reduce the, the budget from level services by a significant amount. And so at that time, uh, we were taking out about $322,000 worth of, of uh, uh, expenses in order to meet the, the revenue we thought we were going to get in what I've thought about today is the halcyon days of January um, relative to revenue predictions for the, for the Commonwealth. Um, obviously, since the, since the uh, COVID crisis kicked in, we've, we've adjusted what we think uh, uh, revenues are, are likely to look like and, and what uh, we've gotten feedback from the, from the member towns about what they think they can afford. And so We've tried to you know, take that into account and put that into place here. And so a couple of things I'll point out, uh, anything in yellow is something that we've done since, since the uh, COVID crisis hit. Uh, in particular, one thing I'll point out on the revenue side, uh, which is the CARES Act. So that, that is an infusion of money. I know it's showing as a negative number with the parentheses around it, but that actually reduces your expenses essentially. Um, but, like, but also immediately below that is, a, is an estimate of a reduction in state support. So we didn't uh, and don't have any particular um, insight as to how or what will be reduced from a state support standpoint, but we do have an expectation that will be a pretty significant drop. Um, it could be Chapter 7, it could be transportation aid to the, to the region, uh, it could play into some of the other factors around uh, special education support and, and that sort of thing. So we sort of left it in a, in a bit of a block of, 
of uh, an estimate of, of uh, reduction and, and didn't try to assign it to any particular category. Um, and then, of course, so those essentially, the CARES Act is, is prescribed and, and dictated by, by the legislation that passed uh, on the federal level and, and you know, the state's using a Title I distribution. So our sort of slice for the regional school district is about $230,000. That's a fairly firm number. Um, so it offsets a fair amount of, of that that we were uh, expecting to cut, but we made some additional reductions in, 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 uh, in expenses to try to, to meet the uh, constraints that, that the member towns are under relative to, to the uh, uh, revenue they think they have to, to fund the school and, and the rest of their operations. And so we made an additional set of reductions of uh, $494,000 on top of what we had already done uh, coming into to, uh, the beginning of March. Um, and so what that results in is this more detailed budget here, and I won't go into too, too much detail, but, but uh, you know, there's a number of factors even within this, even, you know, that, that are, um, as with all budgets, a bit of, of uh, the circumstances as we understood them at the time we, you know, um, so we have some some areas of the budget that may look like they're they're rather s large increases relative to uh, to um, the uh, circumstances we find ourselves. But I think that you know some of the increases that you see in this column uh, are reversed by virtue of this uh, reduction of eight hundred sixteen thousand, which is the three twenty two and the, the four ninety four. So those kind of offset and reduce uh, the overall budget. So we actually have an almost level services budget. It's actually a little below, I mean, not level services, level um, funded budget. It's actually a little below level funded um, from, from the current fiscal year to, to next fiscal year. Um, and so uh, I'll slide to the next slide here and just to show you. And, and so we've had under discussion a number of assessment methodologies over the over the recent years, um, the assessment methodology that that uh, is is currently being recommended uh, by the school committee and is this one with this kind of a beige or a, um, I guess a beige is a or tan sort of color. Uh, it's the forty five percent statutory five year average method. Um, that gets into part of how the calculation is done to, to do the assessment. It was the recommended method coming into uh, to the uh, approval of the budget um, previous to the COVID crisis. And so uh, we've remained with that because it was, uh, you know, the conversations we had had with the communities about uh, our, our shifting of assessment method over a number of years to a, a, a slightly different model. This was another step in the process. The, the member towns were, were familiar and comfortable with that. And, and with the reduction in, in the overall budget, what you see in this, in this slide is that, that the recommended assessment framework is just a little below um, the, uh, the fiscal 20 number. So the fiscal 20 number is here. Uh, the fiscal 20 number, 21 number is here. At, and it's uh, about, just a little, about $40,000 less than the current year's assessment. Um, so with the exception of Leverett, each of the four communities is actually having a lower assessment than they do in fiscal 20. Um, I think one other thing I'll point out, and this, this is something I said earlier, is that we've asterisk the, the uh, chapter 70 and the transportation reimbursement. There's really some others in here that could be as well. And that's just to note that we didn't know, we left our projections from, from pre-COVID situation uh, we left those projections in place, and then we have, by virtue of, of our, our cuts required, uh, we've sort of factored that in. So the, the uh, projections for revenue there on, on uh, the chart from, from the state um, don't reflect the actual thinking that we have. It, it's just we didn't have a place to sort of specifically put it, and so we, we kept it into the sort of cuts required section, uh, but it effectively will affect uh, will affect chapters, you know, chapter 70 is likely to smaller, transportation reimbursement is guaranteed to be smaller, almost almost guaranteed to be smaller. Um, and some of the others may be affected a little bit as well. Um, our use of D&D and some of that will be will be as we have, have predicted and projected here. Um, 
And so that lays out the, the uh, assessment methods and, and the one in particular that we're, we're recommending for this year. Um, I think at this point I'll pivot to the, to the last slide, which is a significant change in, in our expectation around capital. Uh, we recognize that the current fiscal year is, is, uh, had a rather significant alteration of, of plans, and, and uh, so we knew that we would probably be in a situation where um, revenues for fiscal 22 will also likely be uh, challenging to work with. And so by uh, reducing our capital plan rather significantly and trying to anticipate some of the costs that we're going to have to incur for COVID-related uh, expenses, we're trying to, to uh, formulate a capital plan that will uh, you know, keep the kids safe, keep the buildings moving uh, toward, toward the direction we want them to, but at the same time recognize that uh, this, the choices we make here in our capital plan also impact our, our communities um, relative to the assessment they need to pay. And so one of the things also about, about capital is that uh, we don't have cash capital the way Amherst does. Um, so we're not setting aside a certain por portion of our revenue for the purposes of, of doing capital projects. Uh, obviously, if we have revenues above expectations uh, or ex actually really expenses below expectations so that we have uh, resources available, we'll sometimes do a capital project with resources like that. Um, but in general, we borrow the money for our capital expenditure. And what happens is, is that we appropriate, we, we do the borrowing in January or February, that sets your assessment for the next year. And so that's why the assessment, if you're looking at those numbers from earlier, the assessment for debt uh, from the region did not change, even though we've, we've altered the budget and we've significantly altered our capital plan because the borrowing that we would do for these items on the capital plan that I'm displaying now will not be uh, a part of the assessment, the debt assessment to the town of Amherst until fiscal 22. Um, so that was part of the thinking as far as trying to mitigate uh, the sort of out years and the longer term effect of, of the, the difficulty we'll likely see in revenues for the state. So what, by, by reducing our, our capital planning here, um, we're really sort of trying to think even further ahead into fiscal 22 in, in some respects. And so that's, that's part and parcel of that. Um, obviously on the COVID-19 needs, uh, you know, at the time we bring this together and even still we're, we're trying to shape uh, our, our idea of what we need to, to purchase and, and things we'll need to implement in our schools to make them function safely and well for the students. Um, there will be some aspects of this that will be covered by some, uh, some money from the, from the federal government, but I doubt that all of it will be. And uh, so that's the rationale behind putting in a placeholder of about 75,000 for, for the purposes of trying to meet the needs of, of some COVID related items, uh, probably ones that, that won't be covered by, uh, by federal reimbursement. Um, the other two projects, the walk-in cooler freezer is a, a scaled back version of, of that project. Um, and then the grounds uh, improvement is really the removal of uh, a uh, modular on the back of the high school. It's been in, in, you know, slated for removal. It's really starting to become unsafe and, and a bit of a, um, uh, problem relative to fire risk and that sort of thing. So we really wanted to take care of that before it got much, much worse. So I think at this point, I'll, I'll stop this. This has been the slides that I have and, and I'm, I'll uh, turn it back to the superintendent in case he wants to add any additional uh, comments relative to, to what I presented to you and, and uh, be happy to answer any of your questions. Given the time, I'll, I'll turn it over to the chair of the, these committees to see if there's questions, but thank you, Dr. Slaughter. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Slaughter and Superintendent Morris. Uh, so to remind everyone who's uh, watching the meeting, uh, the next two steps that we're going to proceed through is that I am going to be looking for raised hands from members of the council and members of the finance committee. So all eight members of the finance committee and members of the council, and I'm gonna do my best to try and spot order, but if a bunch of hands go up at the same time, I won't be perfect in that score and uh, proceed through. This is the one presentation for the council of the regional school budget. And uh, 
the process that we're going to be engaging in next is that it will be discussed again at the Finance Committee meeting tomorrow, but without uh, the superintendent or uh, Dr. Slaughter being present. Um, and uh, we will, as a Finance Committee, make a recommendation to the Council, uh, which is scheduled to take the budget up uh, on June 29. Uh, but uh, this is for all of the council, your opportunity to ask questions about the budget and um, anything that's related to the budget that you think is important to bring forward. So uh, please take that opportunity. And I see the first hand that was raised uh, is uh, from Councilor Shane. Kathy? Thank you, Andy. Um I think I'll just try to focus on making sure I understand uh, the the numbers and because I'm on finance, so tomorrow we can ask some other questions. So um, when you went through the slide, Doug, that showed um, cuts and additions and you had uh, one was you were prepaying um, the out of district. So that you're, are you able to do that because in this current year you had enough funds that you could prepay? And will you likely be able to have that again next year? So part of what I'm worried about is not just this coming year, but the year after it. So that seemed like you had a buffer there because you you got 170,000 out of that um, being able to move it. So was that because there was you know, what an excess or you had some money in this year's budget that you could do that? So I can, I can try to answer that one, Doug. Um, so the short story is we froze our budget on March 13th, except for essential COVID-19 related items, because we knew we saw the storm coming, uh, the fiscal storm. And it was a way to preserve for one year, knowing the towns were going to have an incredibly hard time, uh, preserve some of the staffing and other things that we knew we'd need moving forward. So we can't bank on that moving forward. We are we tend to budget conservatively, so it's not the only year if you go back that we've prepaid tuitions. Mr. Mangano could fill you in with more details and is wearing his former hat that's still dusty, but I'm sure it's in the closet. Um, and um, But it is, you're, you're rightly noting that it's not something you can necessarily count on year in, year out, um, but it is something that we got incredibly conservative on March 13th, um, and uh, this is exactly why. Okay, and then if I look at the amount of money for CARES, which is a flow in, um, is that your best guess right now? Or is that, you said it's fairly solid. So that is that money in your hands more or less? So I'm just trying to get wh where's the uncertainty even on the numbers you've got on this table? Yep, so this is money that has been assigned to us uh, using a DESI calculation on Title I. Um, it is the case that um, compared to the Great Recession, uh, where this uh, inflation adjusted, the federal government spent about 128, 129 billion trillion dollars on, um, excuse me, billion dollars on K to 12 education, or plus K through higher ed. Uh, so far, they've spent 27, uh, and that was during a less challenging fiscal time without the uh, social distancing and other needs in the pandemic. So I, I think, uh, to your point, this will help us for next year. And I would uh, urge uh, you as counselors to be advocating that the federal government play a larger role. Uh, I, I'm happy to send a uh, slide deck after YouTube video of experts on this who are saying, if the federal government doesn't stop, in, doesn't jump in, schools will not be able to function in the future. And so there is a bill that passed the House, whether that passes the Senate, who knows, but they are the only ones who can jump into this situation. And again, if anyone needs backup, please email me. I'm happy to send you more YouTube videos of experts or articles than uh, you probably want to look at or read. Okay. Um, then um, I'm just going to go down my list as quickly as I can. So the, the guesstimate of a cut in state aid, about what percent did you go ahead and take the leap? I know this is a guess. Um, so uh, the dollar amount. So. Um, you know, I was, I actually went back and looked at some of the 2010 and 20, 2006, like what happened to us last time. Um, so I just, I don't know what you put in here. And if you don't have that right now, I can ask it again tomorrow. I defer to Doug on that one. Okay. So, I mean, as a percentage, I mean, this, the state uh, typically gives us, oh, a little over ten million dollars, so it's it's you know it's a small percentage. Okay. Um, 
that's a short story. Yep. Um, then on um, when I looked at the payroll accounts, and I realized when I went to the next page, you had sort of a pre-COVID FY21, and then at the very bottom, you subtracted out the things, but the administrative cost, central administrative, and then the school administrative went up by about six, a little over 6%, but on the cuts page, you took out a dean. So if, is that that's before you've done the adjustment on the top. It just looked like somehow the administrative staff was increasing more than teaching staff was on, on the, as I said, it's the FY21 before you took out the, the pieces, so. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's exactly it, Kathy. That's, uh, that was uh, based on a level services budget and some things rolled over. Uh, there were other administrative cuts even before the COVID related cuts, so to speak. Um, that cut into administration. There are new, no new administrative positions uh, that are proposed in this budget uh, at all. And if you look at the cuts page, we tried to keep things as way far away from the classroom. Uh, in terms of RIFs or reduction in force notices, uh, at the regional level, all this resulted in a 0.4 uh, RIF, and that was mostly based on someone returning from a one-year position. Um, okay. So we really kept things away. We're not reducing um, sections or we're not reducing um, teacher load. This was purely based on someone who was in a coaching role returning to a teaching role. Um, but there were no program cuts. There were no offering cuts. There were no course cuts based on these, this budget. Okay. And am, am I right in assuming that um, the non-union staff um, got a 2% COLA so that there is, there is that built into this budget? There is. So the non-unit staff in FY19 took a zero, um, just for background for people who weren't aware of that. Uh, things aren't optimistic in terms of that looking forward for FY22 and to think of that happening three out of four years for people who are, uh, I can't get to take vacation as Paul and I have spoken. Um, literally, I wanted to shut down the district for a couple of days because of how intense this process has been and will be over the summer. And they're saying, no, I'll just lose my vacation days because contractually they can max out. Um, I felt for morale and, and for what uh, people are putting in and what they've been through as well as what they will be through. It felt um, felt fair and equitable that they would have the same cola as the teachers for next year. Okay, and I, th I think my, my very last question is the substitute line in the operating budget as you're looking forward, um, it didn't go up very much. And I did listen into your classroom discussion on configuration yeah. and it um, including that any teacher who feels sick should stay home. Right. And so what do you do with the classroom? So it, so just on, that's one that I think um, as the year rolls out, people have to look closely at because you may need to bring in more help than you had to before because teachers would sh come in and teach when they were sick. You know, I mean, they, they weren't, yes. they, <laughs> and they're being asked to absolutely not do that now, you know? So it's just, uh, I was looking at whether that adjustment, and it doesn't look, like you fine tuned that yet. So hopefully there's some contingency funds or some ability to move around in the budget if you have to. That's true. I think the only flip side or the only optimistic fiscal side, I should say of it is that there's, uh, I did not see a scenario in the fall where secondary students are in school every day. Uh, I don't see that as being viable. And so um, that might mitigate some of what you're talking about, but you're absolutely correct that it's, it's something we're aware of and we may have to use more internal staff simply from a uh, public health and safety perspective. Uh, certainly it's a hard job to be a substitute teacher. Uh, to be a substitute teacher in uh, a socially distant school, uh, we are going to have to do training for them and we may have to just literally rely on existing staff to cover um, spaces um, and, and reconfigure things more than external staff coming in. Uh, not just for fiscal reasons, but from public health reasons as well. And, and I want to publicly uh, sing, sing the praises, and I'll do it every moment I can, of Julie Fetterman, who is a rock star in terms of coordinating and connecting with us uh, about this public health piece uh, and how it connects to public education. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to others because I get another chance tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, for anybody who's just tuning in on Amherst Media right now, I just wanted to, or has in the last few minutes, uh, we have two hearings this evening. They were scheduled at 6.30 and 7, um, but uh, the 7 o'clock meeting will begin at the conclusion of this hearing. 
the hearing that we're currently doing is about the proposed regional school budget, uh, which has been presented to Amherst and the other three towns in the region and uh, will um, require council action um, at the end of June. And uh, what we are currently in is uh, questions from members of the Finance Committee and the Council. And uh, then we'll see if there are questions or comments from members of the public. Um, so Mandy Jo Haneke, uh, Mandy, you're next uh, person to ask to be recognized. Thank you, Andy. Um, my questions all sort of go to the same thing, but um, I'm going to try and ask them all together since they're somewhat related. Um, I appreciate the new slide about the assessment method and decreases in budget and increases in, assess in assessments and how that happens mid-year. Um, because I look at a budget and I look at the unknowns and I foresee budgets having to change. So I just want to confirm that, you know, we've got a proposed budget in front of us that actually shows an increase in revenue from the state. Um, you've addressed that a little bit as to how I'm still confused as to how that is calculated as a decrease when it shows an increase um, and it comes off the total operating budget and then you calculate the assessment required. Once we pass an assessment of whatever that would be about 16.4 million, if the state aid does not come in where it's assessed um, or in the budget, which is around 11 million right now and, and change, that would in theory, unless the budget itself decreases, the $32 million budget decreases, would require the way I think about it as either as an increase in the town's assessments. Um, and so I wanna confirm that if state aid doesn't come in where the budgeted numbers are, the 11.7 showing on our budget on the fourth sheet of the slide, that if the regional school committee does not reduce the total operating budget of 32 million in response to a lower state aid, that Amherst would actually have to affirmatively pass an increase in assessment above the 16.4 million. I just wanna make sure I'm clear on that. Um, and the next question sort of goes to that issue, which is I, I've seen, I think Desi came out with some sort of guidelines on Friday about PPE and state, you know, classroom sizes and all. And some of that concerns me. Um, no more than 12 people in a classroom is one thing I read. No more than 10 students in a classroom. Um, that has severe budget implications, I can only guess. Um, how is that manageable under a budget like this? And is, is this budget, I guess the question is, is this budget reasonable given the guidelines we're seeing from the CDC, from the DESE? Are we going to be looking at, instead of a decrease based on revenue from, a potential decrease in revenue from the state, are we gonna be looking at a mid-year budget request to increase the budget um, or can you operate under this budget and CDC guidelines? I guess is one of my questions. How how reasonable is that to expect? Sure. Well, I can jump in a little bit, and if if Dr. Sutter wants to add, he can. I mean, I think the regional school committee have a number of tools that's disposable. One of which uh, you said could be engaged with towns. Uh, the region does have an E and D line, um, so it does have reserves, and depending what if there's a gap, what that gap is. Uh, could think to use that also as a school choice line. So I think there's a number of different scenarios that the school committee could use. Um, it certainly would want to keep all the town's elected officials uh, connected to that and um, in order to make decisions. In terms of, you know, in terms of the DESE guidance, let me clarify. What came out was that the class size piece was about summer school. Um, if towns choose to have summer school, they have not come out and that won't come out till next week about class size guidelines in classrooms. So we are analyzing class spaces. I think it's, it's um, our estimates, depending on the classroom, 11 to 15 students can be in a class. Uh, we're, the high school in particular is a Frankenstein kind of building. It was built in three phases and you know, um, so some classrooms have more space or different uh, orientation than others. Um, I think, as I said last week, there is no scenario that I foresee that all, that all regional students will be back in school five days a week, uh, anytime with the current CDC guidance in place. 
I think as a little preview to our Thursday school committee meeting, we have, we have two school committees this week. Um, you know, the survey that I mentioned has over 700 responses. And I think uh, for many people, um, it comes as a surprise to them that the CDC guidance will equate to a, a pretty significant shift in the number of days in school their children will be attending uh, and the options. Uh, and I think Ms. McDonald and I were pretty clear about this. Uh, no one likes any of the options, right? Um, and, and that's true across the Commonwealth as well. And so I think to your point, the challenge will be how do we meet uh, the greatest number of students' needs um, in all three districts. Um, sorry, because my job is, has all three districts. That's the way I'm thinking about this. And we're having a number of joint meetings for that purpose. And uh, what's possible, what's advisable, um, but there, there's no scenario I see where 950 students can be in the high school at a time. It's just not going to happen. Right. Um, and, and I think the Gazette got the headline right. So whoever wrote that, I think it was Scott, well done, that we need to de-densify the schools. Right. It's not just about number of kids in a school. It's all the other factors, number of kids in a hallway. How do we get kids lunch? Right. All those pieces um, contribute to it. So uh, I think what uh, is going to happen and my my prediction is that we'll have to have a pretty thorough process. And, and as Ms. McDonald uh, has been great about. We're engaging the public early and often, uh, both with public presentations and surveys, and the surveys that we just put out is not the last one that we're going to offer, um, to be able to come to hopefully a community consensus of what's the most important thing in the long term for our students, and particularly as it relates to the edu educational debt or our achievement gap, that people use different terms, uh, that we have, um, that we have to weigh. And so it's going to be messy. Um, it's not going to be clean. I think that, that another preview of the data is that I wouldn't say there's consensus on uh, a model or an option. I think there's going to be lots of discussion that needs to occur. Uh, but the reality is, you know, our, we're trying to be good fiscal stewards despite this situation. Uh, we are not unique. Every district's going through it. Unfortunately, some of our space needs are, are more challenging. For instance, the middle school has classrooms that don't have windows, which according to CDC guidelines is a big problem because um, the ventilation doesn't, doesn't allow for external ventilation with a window. Um, so we're analyzing all those pieces. Um, it's a long-winded way to say you're right, it's complicated. You're right, the amount of funds that we have to give is, is probably inconsistent with what's needed uh, to do the best job that we wish we could do. Um, some of those are not short-term fixes. We can't pop out and build a window when there's no air on the other side of it. It's, it's uh, this, the rooms that are back-to-back. Um, but I think what we're committed to is engaging the public with realistic scenarios, um, getting their feedback and making the best decision we can uh, for our students. But uh, there is no wonderful scenario. And I think comparing uh, mid-COVID school to pre-COVID school is actually something that we have to start doing a better job. I have to start doing a better job uh, communicating. It's not actually a helpful comparison. Um, it's really about what mid-COVID school uh, option versus other mid-COVID school options uh, do we have, and there are fiscal implications, as you note, uh, to all of those decisions. Um, you know, for instance, and then I'll stop because I, I could go on for this forever. It's a good question, and it's obviously what I'm uh, breathing these days. Uh, you know, people are saying, well, why don't you rent, you know, a building or use the bank center or things like that, right? So every school building we use has to have a nurse has to have an administrator in this. So it's not just simply about the spaces and getting more, it's actually the staffing that would accompany those spaces uh, that makes it high, even more problematic than just, can we get a couple of classrooms here or there? Um, if it wasn't a public health crisis, maybe we could, make, we could get by with being more flexible. That's not in the cards for us this year. And so uh, I think we have to live within our means, both from a space perspective, we're gonna do our best financially the PPE, the personal protective equipment email that you referenced that came on Friday, um, you know, the number of materials, a neighboring district, similar size district, estimated there'll be 400 pieces of PPE needed in the first couple months. Um, and that isn't free. We are working with uh, the town and I wanna publicly suggest uh, and state that the town has been wonderful about partnering with us on that. And, and um, I feel very fortunate to be working with town staff and with the uh, this community values education so much. Not everybody has that luxury. So long-winded. I apologize. I'll I'll be quicker next time. Uh, Andy, can I just uh, jump in? Uh, yes. Uh, it's not 400. It's 400,000 oh, pieces of PPE. Sorry. Oh, my apologies. I was so worried about timing. I lopped <laughs> off three zeros. Um, my apologies. Thank 400 you. 400 did sound a little low. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. It's. Uh, Dorothy. 
No. All right. Uh, Thank you. Um, if Doug? I could add one quick thing. Okay. Um, I have a quick question. Um, we've changed the way we do health insurance, <laughs> self-insured, but I just wanted to be sure that if um, a number of teachers did catch COVID-19 and had extended and expensive hospitalization, would that affect our budget or would, since we're now part of a bigger system, would we keep our, our what's in the budget as our estimate? I'll just refer to Dr. Slaughter on that. All right, I can answer that. Um, so the, the short answer is it, it wouldn't really, uh, it would likely when we go to renew our rates, we renew our rates each year. Uh, it might have an impact on our rates in fiscal 22 uh, to some extent, but that's also gonna be our experience in combination with everybody else's experience. And it's a much bigger pool than we used to have. So um, I don't think it'll be uh, too, too bad in that regard. Um, you know, it's, it, if we had a, a significant draw on our insurance by virtue of a number of people being in, in uh, expensive hospitalization or healthcare circumstances, yeah, it would have a negative impact, but it'd be mitigated in, to some extent relative to the others that are in the group with us. Um, and they recognize that there's some peaks and valleys to things uh, in some respects. There's one other thing I wanted to point out in, in talking about, uh, just back to, to, to Mandy Joe's uh, question around uh, the revenue picture. Um, the thing to keep in mind is in that revenue section of that slide, the fourth of five, and it, it, has, uh, it has a number of revenue sources, not all are state revenue sources. So the total is 11.7, uh, but you know, E&D and E&D for contingency are both money we've got in hand in reserves. We have additional reserves on top of that that we will also uh, could potentially draw on. It would require uh, you know, action by uh, each of the four communities to do that. Um, if we were to utilize those those funds, those reserve funds, um, in, interest revenue is also not a state aid uh, piece. Um, but charter reimbursement, some aspects of Medicaid, that depends on how much service we provide. Um, those all have variables and, and have state components to them. I think if I could add one last thing um, is the other thing we've really slowed down filling vacancies. Um, and so we're waiting to see more state guidance uh, because we do know there's uncertainty there. We've heard really, I've heard personally different, really different things from different state legislators and what to expect. Uh, and I'm not alone in that regard. I think that the municipal side is, is probably in a, in a similar space. Uh, so I think we've, we've tried to be conservative uh, on things that we could be moving forward as well. Mandy, you have a follow up? Yeah, um, I just wanted to to track back. I, I had two parts to sort of my question on the revenue on the revenue and then on the assessment. So if I could get maybe an answer to confirm the assessment understanding that I have that if we pass this budget and state aid decreases by 25 or 30 percent, and so the budget at 32.1 million is, if you, your state aid isn't subtracting your 11 or 10 per, 10 million out, it's only subtracting 8 million out. Do we have to if the school committee does not reduce the budget by that two million, say, does Amherst have to revote and approve an increase above the sixteen point four million dollars in assessment in order to be assessed higher, even if the budget funded budget thirty two point one four five million does not change? The short answer is yes. Uh, however, I think if 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 the state aid dropped by that large a percentage. I think the school committee, I mean, my, my suggestion, you know, as finance director, I think the superintendent's suggestion and perhaps the way the school committee would, would take action would be to, um, you know, review if there were any other, and, and we would be into the fiscal year a little bit. We would have a lot more clarity on exactly what uh, the program we're trying to execute is, is looking like. And so I think uh, we would have a much better idea of how we might be able to reduce our expenditure even more. Um, we'd have much better numbers on exactly what our staffing looks like. You know, right now we have uh, projections on who and how many, you know, people we are anticipating needing and that sort of thing. We'll have much greater clarity on all of those types of things. So we'd look to obviously reduce our expenses and lower the overall budget as best we could before we went back to any of the four towns and asked for more. Um, and we also factor in the fact that, you know, uh, there's only so much capacity among the four communities to, to take on additional expense. And so, you know, we, we don't live in isolation here. We're, we're trying to recognize that, uh, 
you know, each of our four member communities are, are affected negatively as well when we are. And so we recognize that and, and we'll take that into account. And I'll just add to that, uh, and I don't mean to be flip about it, um, and hopefully this isn't perceived that way, but if, if Chapter 70 drops 25 or 30%, no one's running school next year across the Commonwealth. Um, this school year is getting incredibly more expensive. Uh, towns across the Commonwealth do not have the capacity to make up that gap. Um, and um, that, you know, you think of us, you can think of larger districts and what it would mean for 25% loss in Chapter 70 for large urban districts that are much more reliant on state aid than we are. Um, so I think the state will have, and, and that's, I know that's a political statement, but it's the truth. And so uh, any advocacy that we can have from the town council, both with the state and the federal government, we'd appreciate it um, just because we know the economy of the town isn't going to function if the schools aren't functioning. Okay, well, thank you. I don't see additional questions right now from other members of the Council of the Finance Committee. If there are additional questions, we'll have one more opportunity for counselors and the Finance Committee members to come back at the end. I want to make sure that we now take the time for those members of the public who are watching who uh, wish to offer public comment by way of questions. Uh, or comment or comments that they have, we ask you to limit your comments to three minutes, and uh, that you indicate if you are participating on um, the Zoom uh, call, you can use uh, raise hand to ask to be identified, and uh, if you're participating by telephone, you can press star nine on your telephone. So I'll just give it a moment, and uh, uh, President Griesmer is going to let me know if there's anybody. I don't think that there is who's asked to be recognized. There's nobody at this time. Okay. So um, thank you. And is there any um, additional questions from members of the Finance Committee or members of the Council? So seeing none, uh, then I think that uh, uh, we can, uh, well, I have uh, noticed that just, just in time, Mary Lou Talman has uh, asked to be recognized. Mary Lou. Uh, uh, yes, we're talking about this as a plan and that's great, but are we talking about it just for the fall or is this for a whole year? This is a whole year from now, and much has changed within the last three or four months. So between now and January, we may know far more, and maybe schools will be in full session. So my question is, is this plan for the whole academic year or just for the fall semester at this point in time? Mary Lou, if I know the answer to that question, uh, I'd be going on TV left and right. I'd be selling the answer to that question. Uh, I would love to know, and I don't mean to be in jest. Uh, I'd love to know that the answer to that question. I mean, I think you know some of this gets to vaccine and, and timelines for vaccine. Uh, we, the reality is we don't know. Um, the CDC guidance, uh, my clear answer, uh, and I apologize for the poor attempt at humor, but the CDC guidance has three steps. Step one is schools are closed because the data, you know, and it, there's a whole chart on page nine of that document, the data shows that schools can be closed. Step two is that schools are open with uh, enhanced social distancing. Step three is schools are open with social distancing. There is no step four until there's a vaccine. Um, so your guess is as good as mine. I tend to be a pessimistic person on these kind of things. Um, there are those who are more optimistic than me. I like those people. I hope that they're right. I pray that they're right, honestly, for in terms of people's lives. Um, but I, I, it's not something I can predict. Uh, the challenge at the secondary level is that once we go down a road, uh, we don't really have a great way to undo it. So let me give you really specific. So at the high school level, it's likely the case that we will have to adapt the schedule to reduce the number of sections that students attend a day. So when students are in, right now they attend six classes a day. They have seven classes total and there's a drop schedule. That's not going to happen next year. There'll be fewer classes a day to reduce the number of opportunities that students are mixing with one another. Uh, you can't go back once you've gone down that path completely. Students could be in school more, but you can't undo what you've set up. And it might be a model where students are taking 
almost like more like a block schedule where they're in fewer classes, more time. If you look at the Beloit model, a lot of colleges are looking at, they're looking at having students take two classes at a time. I'm not saying that'll happen at our high school, but that's, that's a common model that colleges are looking at to, again, to promote containment. And so once you go down that model, uh, you can't, it's not as easy to undo what you've started. Um, so uh, the short answer is it's complicated. We don't know. I hope the vaccine comes sooner. Uh, there are some commitments that will be made uh, in the fall that may not be completely reversible, even if students are in more often. Uh, and so that is one of the vexing things of the situation. Not only do we know what, not know what state funding is, not know what the state model is that they're going to at least promote to us, we actually don't know how long this will last. And, and that makes an additional challenge. It's exactly the right question to ask. Um, unfortunately, I can't give you a very satisfactory answer. Well, a follow-up then would be, how does it, this impact the extracurricular for children and the uh, sports, um, the MIA? So that's another thing we're waiting on. I mean, the, the CDC guidance is pretty clear that uh, they're really talking about sports that can be played with social distancing um, that eliminates some and it does permit others. Uh, I looked at Connecticut. Uh, they have released their sports um, plan for fall. Um, you know, a great video, if you've just Google CDC Foundation, they have um, the, uh, they have the public health director or doctor from Mississippi, as well as their school committee, um, head of their school committee association. And the public health doctor said, essentially, you know, I can tell people not to play football all I want. It's Mississippi. People are going <laughs> to play football. I was talking to Doug about this earlier. I think what we have to do is we have to be very cautious and I've been very conservative and, and some people like that and some people don't and I get that, uh, that we're going to follow the public health guidance. That's going to drive our decision making and we're going to make the best public health, best public education decisions based on public health and not the other way around because I think when it's a slippery slope once you go down, well, I think it'll be okay and so MIA and the state will come out with that information. Um, and so uh, I think it is a concern. It's also a concern for before and after school programs. We do have an after school program at the middle school, as well as many, many, as you know, clubs and after school experiences. But the key print, one of the key principles in the CDC guidance is that students stay or are in as few groups as possible. You don't want students mixing with other students. And some of that's um, around uh, how the virus spreads. It's also around if this virus, virus comes, do you need to shut down a classroom or do you need to shut down the school and for how long? Um, so there's a lot of different reasons. Uh, you know, I tend to like some sports that would be contact sports. I like watching them. Uh, I'm not sure how likely it is that we can do that. Uh, football is a good example. Dr. Slaughter knows very well. Um, I like watching football games. Our team had a historic season this year. It was fantastic. Uh, I'm not saying there won't be football, but that is a sport that's hard to play in a socially distanced manner. Well, thank you very much for all the thank answers. You. Thank you for the questions. And, and if there's no others, if there ends up being no others, thank you very much for the council for for having us and engaging us in you know, a really uncertain time. So I want to remind my uh, fellow counselors that um, as last year, uh, there was one presentation at, the, at the, the equivalent of this hearing, which was much earlier in the budget cycle year, um, where the superintendent and finance director from the schools was present to present the budget and answer questions for us. And uh, again, this is anticipated to be that meeting, that hearing, and uh, we will uh, be taking up the budget after discussion in the Finance Committee at the June 29th meeting, which is about the time that the town meetings in um, the other towns will be taking place. Um, there is a process that uh, would allow for a one twelfth budget, which would be only used if we fail to get the three town meetings in the council and meeting votes in time. I don't know if my uh, superintendent Morris, you have something to add. Yeah, I just wanted to comment. I think as as the council knows that we did have to submit the request for the one twelfth budget. The way it works under state um, guidance is that we we submit that to DESE to the state uh, if we don't have all towns agree on a budget by June first. We did indicate that, that we believe there's support for this budget. And as long as the budget's passed in all four communities by July 1st, 
Uh, it's not something we'll have to manage, but uh, the state feels like they couldn't wait till June 27th when two of our towns have town meetings. Uh, if, if it failed at one of those meetings, that would give them a very short timeline to set up a 112th budget. So we did submit that document and just wanted to make sure the council and the, and the public were aware that we, we were um, asked to do that. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, so I see no other hands uh, raised and uh, uh, the president hasn't advised me that there's anybody from the public who's asked to participate. Um, I want to thank uh, Superintendent Morris, uh, Dr. Slaughter, and School uh, Committee Chair McDonald for having uh, spent the time with us in the public hearing this evening and uh, for having participated in the hearing on this budget, which is, as I noted earlier, required by our uh, home rule charter. So uh, thank you very much to the superintendent and um, the others who participated this evening. And with that, I am going to um, declare the first of our two hearings regarding the regional school budget to close and uh, convene so that we can convene the other hearing and I'll ask, stop for just a moment to ask the president of the council if she wishes uh, to have us take a recess before going to the second hearing or shall we move straight into the next hearing? I think, I think we should move in straight into it. It's past seven o'clock, it's 7.35. And so let's just keep going. Okay, so uh, with that, um, I will, uh, uh, convene the in call order the hearing for the one month budget and just to remind um, everyone of what uh, we agreed to that there is a um, the, the uh, town manager is working with his staff on preparing a FY21 budget but in order to give uh, more time until uh, June 29th for uh, the preparation of the, and presentation of that budget, we need to do a one month budget, which um, is to allow for appropriations to be made to allow for operations during the month of July. And uh, it will then be incorporated and become a part of the full year budget. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to the superintendent uh, and we will be following exactly the same procedure as with the last uh, hearing uh, with the same sequence presentation from the town manager and staff that he wishes to introduce and incorporate into his presentation and then questions from all counselors and uh, finance committee members. Uh, and again, I will try and recognize people just in order that hands go up and uh, see if there are any members of the public who wish to ask questions or make comments. So uh, with that, I turn it over to the town manager. Thank, thank you, Andy. Um, so first I wanna say, you know, thanks to the superintendent and uh, Finance Director for the Schools, Dr. Slaughter, uh, terrific job. They do a phenomenal job and I, they, the work they have cut out for them is just immense. Um, I, I'm communicating with Mike seven days a week, every day. I can't, I think of a day that we didn't communicate on something uh, during the last three months. So, and it's, you should know that that's an unusual situation. Uh, he's a high communicator and um, it doesn't happen in many towns where the town side and the school side work so closely together. So it's a history for the town. And I think that that's, that's a terrific thing. I thank Mike and Doug and the school committee for the way they conduct this. Um, also want to recognize that we are being staffed by uh, Athena O'Keefe and Serge Fedorovsky who are doing the staffing for this meeting. So if people see those names on the, on the screen, that's there are the town staff supporting the council and the finance committee during this meeting. And tonight I'm joined by Sean Mangano, the finance director, and Sonia Aldridge, our comptroller, who will do the bulk of the presentation. Um, this is one of our public hearings, as uh, the chair said, and you know, we have the region, we have the one month budget, we will have a public forum on the capital improvement program, and then we'll have a, another public hearing on the 
FY21 budget, and that will be followed by about eight individual finance committee meetings where we go into that budget in deep detail. So this is the beginning of the one month budget. Uh, this is permitted, as the chair said, um, by virtue of a vote of the town council on April 27th that um, actually directed the town manager to create a one month budget along these guidelines. Um, so with that, I think uh, Sean Mangano is gonna take the lead. He has a few slides. This is going to follow very much the same format that, uh, that we made to the town council um, a week ago. So Sean. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, this is gonna look pretty familiar to the presentation from a couple of weeks ago. Um, we did add a couple new slides uh, to respond to some questions that came in. Um, so some of this will be a refresher. So a little bit about why we are going with the one month budget. We do have uh, quite a bit of uncertainty this year, probably more than any other year I've been involved with. Um, we need more time to gather information on some of our revenues and expenditures. And some of those major um, items that we're looking at are what the colleges and universities are gonna do in terms of reopening and what that means for our local economy and the expenditures associated with the colleges and university. Uh, what the K-12 schools, library, and other town services do. Uh, you just heard a, a great presentation from the superintendent and school finance director. Um, there's a lot going on there and, and may have some additional costs. Um, so we have to keep an eye on that. Uh, the state budget and what our state aid sources look like, um, state and federal government aid programs. So aside from our regular state aid that we get from um, the government, what else is coming in? We have the CARES Act. We've got a pretty good handle on what's available right now, but there is talk about the scope of some of those funds um, possibly being broadened so we can use it for revenue replacement, um, but that hasn't happened yet. So um, we're keeping a close eye on that. And then just keep an eye on our local economy and the local receipts. Um, since the last time we presented this, we've been able to dive into our enterprise funds quite a bit more and gauge the impact on water, sewer, parking, and solid waste to get a sense of what's going on with those revenues and, and forecast those into the future. Um, so a lot of unknown around these different areas. And for that, that's why we're putting forward a one month budget. Um, the total one month budget is on your left and it'll be the same on every slide. Um, the total is $11,570,046, and it's broken into the different functional areas and then enterprise funds. Um, it is a one-month budget. It's not a one-twelfth budget because it does include some large one-time expenditures, um, well, really one large one-time expenditure, um, but it also factors in actual spending patterns as well. So I will scroll down. So this budget gives us the authorization to expend funds in July. Uh, if we didn't do it, and we, we would have to have a full budget by July 1. Um, we came up with these amounts by using our accounting system to see what has been spent in the past, and also consulting with department heads to get a sense of whether, you know, the historical spending aligns with what they think they need for the coming year. Um, the Hampshire County Pension Assessment is the one, sort of the single really large expenditure that is paid during the month of July. Um, it's paid during July because the pension system gives us a discount if we pay it at all up front, and it's a pretty sizable discount. So most most communities in the pension system do pay it all up front. Um, this is not intended to replace our full FY21 budget document. You will still get the nice 200, 300 page document electronically at some point. Um, it does not include any additions or reductions. So there's no programmatic or, or operational changes in this one month budget. This is just to get us through to the, the full budget. Um, we'll get into much more conversation around the, any proposed additions or reductions during that time. And the hope is that the 12 month budget will completely replace this one month budget. So we're not gonna bring forward a, an 11 month budget to you, which kind of, you know, you can't really get the historical context for that. We're gonna bring forward a full 12 month budget, which will replace this one month budget um, during the month of July. So as I said, it's not a one twelfth budget and I will you pull, call upon my experience at the schools to explain why. Um, so the schools are a good example. They, the salaries go way down during the summer because some staff at the, um, at the schools are only paid from September through July. So you'll see salaries go way down for July, but you'll also again, get that pension assessment that hits during the month of July. So that's why it's not exactly a one twelfth where expenditures are equal every single month. 
Um, we really did look at actual spending and then take into account, you know, a little bit of an increase for, for the inflation, things of that nature. Uh, there was a question on the retirement assessment, which is a separate item in the one month budget. You'll see it's there at uh, $6,192,108. That's just the general fund portion of the retirement assessment. Um, the question that we received was, what is the amount for those other areas? So we did include those here, so you can see the different amounts, um, which are included in those other enterprise funds. And there's a question about what are the most significant one-time expenses? Um, so really the pension assessment is the really significant one-time expense. There are a few other little ones that are, will vary by department. Um, sometimes there's maintenance agreements that are paid in July that you pay for the full year, um, subscriptions, there's sometimes longevity payments that come up. Um, but those are, are very small relative to the, to the one large expense that I described. So there's a question about whether capital is included in these enterprise funds budgets. Um, it isn't currently, it will be part of the 12 month budget conversation. Uh, but right now this is just to keep the enterprise funds going for the month of July. And the last question that we received was what, what I mentioned a little bit before, you know, have we looked at the impact of COVID-19 on the enterprise fund revenues and expenditures? And we have, we've been looking at consumption of water and, um, and sewer consumption um, and particularly the impact of the college not being in session on those enterprise funds because it water consumption, sewer consumption went down. Um, also parking, the fact that there's not a lot of uh, usage of parking right now and we haven't been collecting, um, we haven't been charging fines and things of that nature. Um, so parking revenues also went down. So we are looking at that for the 12 month budget conversation um, and we'll have much more to present uh, for that 12 month budget um, on enterprise funds. And with that, I will turn it over back to the chair. Andy, you're uh, muted still. You're still muted, Andy. So I think now we're here. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, some of the questions that I had posed in advance have been answered, but um, this now becomes a time for members of the council and the finance committee to ask questions. So I will be, as I said earlier and did in the first round, be looking for raised hands and respond and then try and recognize people in the order in which they, I see the hands are being raised. And uh, the uh, other things that I'd like to remind you of is that there is a series of, that it goes on because we really have the capital budget. There will be a separate forum that's required by a different section of the um, charter that requires that there be a forum on the uh, regarding the capital plan and that's required to be a council forum and so it will be um, called by the president of the council um, in accordance with the charter provision um, there will also be a second hearing because uh, the, if you look at the charter it requires that there be a hearing on the FY21 budget, which is the finance committee is tentatively scheduling for July 13. And uh, the, uh, in addition uh, to, to this hearing about the one month budget and uh, the council vote is anticipated that we will be as finance committee reporting back to the council uh, in order to be able to take a vote on the one month budget on June 15th. Uh, the annual FY21 budget to be presented um, on June 29th um, and uh, then a series of meetings of the Finance Committee as has been previously noted. So, turn to my colleagues on the Council of the Finance Committee, does anybody have questions? Uh, 
I see uh, Kathy, you have the first question. So let me okay. turn to you. I just jumped in when I didn't see other hands. Um, I have one that's more general about what we know already as you, when I looked at the one month, Sean, you just explained, and it was very clear why some of these one months are less than a one twelfth of the budget guidelines. The, the regional school is, I think, exactly. Um, do we have a sense now, or when will we? Will we have it early July? Um, were there savings on this year's operating budget because we had less overtime, um, some, you know, with, with staff, um, that could, if state aid is down, if some other things are down, or when we come back. So it's not so much this one month, but is any was any of that figured into this one month that you know that you've got some money that if expenses come in more than we expected for the town, as the town services, as people start to come back, that, that helps buffer it. And so that's question one, one. and the other one is pretty easy. I. I, Paul gave me an answer to it, but I'll just ask it here. Is is the 2% COLA figured for all the non-union staff in this budget? And if yes, um, when we go to the full budget, uh, does any decision we make around the one month budget affect decisions we might want to make later on the full year budget? So, and that would be just an example, um, but also on staffing and other things that we'll see in the full year. Yeah, so I'll start. Is that okay, Paul, if I start? Um, so I think your first question was about looking at this year and what expenditures look like this year, um, and has that been factored into what we're thinking about for next year? Um, I'll let Sonia speak to that a little bit. She is working on projections for what the rest of this year looks like um, to determine if there's any savings this year, or we're pretty confident we're not going to need any additional funds at this point. Um, and anything that does get turned back this year will go into our planning around the use of reserves going forward. Um, Sonia, do you want to talk a little bit about the process you're doing right now? After you unmute yourself? Yeah, you thanks, Sean. <laughs> I'll figure this out eventually. Um, yes, I was looking at it quickly today. Uh, our revenues are coming in better than I expected, so I don't think we're going to be, we might have a small deficit, but not as much as I thought it was going to be. Remember, I said about 500000 so, and then we have, um, we have lots of savings because we had vacant positions for quite a while on the operating budget, which will offset any deficit in revenue. And whatever is left would fall to free cash. We can't commit it for next year's budget. It would just fall to reserves. I don't have figures right now. Everyone's handing in their carry forwards, what's out there committed that needs to get paid. It's going to be a process before I have final numbers. And normally, just to add to that, a lot of that we don't find out the final number until the end of July or even into August when everything is completely stopped um, and we can reconcile everything. Um, your second question was about the cost of living adjustment increases. So that was factored into this one month budget. Um, those have been rolled forward um, at the 2%. Um, Paul, do you want to speak a little bit about the, if there's any, if it changes after that? Yeah, so um, we did put the 2% in this just as the schools did, and um, that would go into effect on July 1. Um, the 2% um, is what all the other unions, all the unionized employees are receiving. Uh, so to single out the non-union employees, uh, I thought was not fair. And also, they're the ones uh, we're uh, the ones who are doing the bulk of the work right now, and getting through this very difficult time. So uh, again, uh, you know, uh, in alignment with what the school department has done, uh, that's what we're proposing as well. I just just want to make sure people understand my question on cola. I wouldn't, you know, I would completely agree that the moderately or lower paid staff, and I'm just looking at what some other entities have done, not towns necessarily where the very top people have said we can forgo that small increase this year or for part of the year so it, th that was the question but i think you also had told me by email paul is that all these decisions can be revisited with the 12 month and i mean there are no furloughs in here now i mean we don't really know much about staffing here 
if if things go south. Um, right. So the tool that we would use is sort of, is the same tool the university would use, which is is using now for FY twenty actually. But we don't really compare ourselves to the university. Our situations are totally different. Our pay schedules are totally different. We do compare ourselves to other communities, and you know our neighboring communities are doing the same thing we are here. Um, so and in terms of um, implementation of that, I think that we would in, implement them on on J July one, as I said. Oh, and then what I want to add is the tool that we do have in our possession is the furlough tool, and that it can have the same impact as a uh, not including the cost of living, and that's a better tool in my mind and from you know Sonia and Sean's mind, because that's something that we can apply across the board. So if we have to if we have a big deficit and we have to cut it, um, we can and we have to reduce our expenses, we would ask all employees to say, take a, a little bit of a cut instead of a small number of employees taking a very big cut. So we can do that um, in the course of the year when we need that tool. So it's a, uh, the use of furloughs is something I think is much more understandable to employees as well. If, if we show a deficit and employees understand that we have to cover that deficit through um, reduction of, of costs and everybody's sharing the pain in essence, uh, and they're not working, so there's a there's a, a feeling like, oh, I'm not working, I'm therefore I'm not getting paid. And so I find that that's a much better tool. It's more flexible, and we can we can call it to order uh, when we need it. Uh, and if that happens, and if we find out in November, December, whenever we need it, we can we can pull that pull the trigger on that. Uh, Sonia, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that we've used the um, uh, the COLA method before where we've not given COLA to the union or we've cut pay like $1,500 across the board or for the lower paid non-union employees and stuff. And it throws our pay scales off. We just, we just actually recovered from the last time we did that last year. So it really throws everything off. So the, the most efficient way to do it is with furloughs across the board. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, people who have their hands raised right now. Um, I just, uh, before asking to see if there's anybody from the public who wishes to um, speak, uh, we'll ask one thing, which is confirmation. There is a difference between, of course, uh, level services, which was the measure of the budget that we originally had thought we would be asking in uh, that was in the uh, first set of guidelines that the council issued and then uh, level funding, which is what the current level is by whatever increase in amounts was. And usually when you go between those two, there are adjustments that have to be made in either staffing or programs. Uh, and uh, we'll get into this discussion in greater detail with the uh, full FY21 budget, uh, but I'm assuming that you have that there are no uh, significant changes in staffing or programs that are built into the one month budget at this point. And that uh, I just want to get that confirmation if that's a correct assumption. Yeah, I can speak to that. Not from a budgetary standpoint, there isn't. Um, there may be operational because of COVID-19 and, you know, things that happened last summer might not happen the same way this summer, um, just as we all would expect, um, but there are no budgetary programmatic reductions built into the one month budget. Okay. Is there anyone else from the council who wishes to ask any questions at this point or from the finance committee? Uh, because again, this is going to move fairly quickly with the uh, schedule that we have of um, this being before the council on June 15th. Seeing nobody who's asked from the council, um, for members of the public, again, mind you that um, this is a public hearing, and uh, so we welcome questions or comments. Uh, ask that you try and limit anything if you do wish to comment or ask a question to three minutes, that if you're participating by Zoom, you can use the raise hand function. 
if you're participating by telephone, uh, you can use the star nine on your telephone to indicate to um, us that you wish to be recognized. So uh, I will um, pause for a moment uh, and ask the president who is going to monitor this to make sure to let us know if there's anybody who's asked to be recognized. But nobody at this time. Nobody so at this time. Not, so there, there uh, is none. I do see one council counselor who's asked to be identified and I will keep an eye or um, president will keep an eye on the attendees list to make sure that nobody's come in late. Uh, but I'm going to uh, recognize uh, that now there's two counselors, but Councillor Pam first and then Councillor Brewer in that order. So Dorothy. Okay. I just want to make a comment that I have heard from a number of people that they would prefer in the future if we had a meeting and not a webinar so that they could um, be seen and participate, feel that they're more in the room with us. I know there's technical problems, uh, but I think that uh, there's an attempt to work on that. So I'm just making the point now because it's been spoken to me. I've been, it's been passed on to me a number of times recently. Uh, Andy, I'd like yes, to- Thank you. Uh, uh, Lynn? Yeah. Uh, uh, Dorothy, thank you for bringing that up. And I just say that not related to this hearing, but separately today, we had a conversation with IT uh, to see whether or not we can figure out some kind of registration system that allows people to come into meetings and be seen. So we're working on it. We're very aware of it. It's a, com a comment that came up regularly during our district meetings and also now periodically during council meetings. Okay. Great. Thank you. you have one other comp, uh, hand up. Andy. Yeah, I do. Uh, Alyssa. Thank you. I just wanted to mention, since I know the Finance Committee will be meeting tomorrow, that I completely support the uh, schools and the town's approach to COLAs and future furlough considerations, using that as a tool either potentially later in the year or hopefully not until the following year, because we have no reason to believe the following year is going to be great. And, um, you know, recognizing what was said clearly about we work to be both an employer of choice and to be comparable to our peer communities. And we're not in any way, shape or form anything like the UMass Athletic Department and how it's talking about little teeny tiny give backs from certain people. That's not the way our salaries are set up at, at either the school or the town level. So I, I am very appreciative of the thought that went into that and looking at what we did in the past when we did make a straight dollar figure cut and it was a mistake as many people suggested at the time and it created ill will and it also didn't help us in terms of getting to our other goals. So thank you for thinking through all those different possibilities because I know a lot of different people are doing it different ways. So, thank you. Anybody else? Um, Mary Lou. This is said, but whatever we do, it needs to be consistent across the town and the schools and the library. So if we're doing colas, it's for everyone and not colas here and something else there. Um, and the, uh, I have a second question about um, the budget in terms of is there anything in here for summer programs uh, for uh, children or are we not going to do LSSE this summer? Um, I'll let Paul weigh in because he's spoken with Barb about this. Um, there is a budget for the community services and for LSSE in here, uh, but Paul can talk more about what that might look like. Yeah, so the guidelines came out for how to do summer camps and they're so onerous um, that we've determined that we cannot do municipal camps this year. Um, and we really feel terrible about that because I know a lot of people depend on it. Um, but the uh, types of camping experience that children would experience under the, the guidelines that the state has put down would not make it doable for us. So we will not be offering camps and we will be making an announcement about that tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Anything else from members of the council? If not, um, 
then I think that we can um, call a hearing of the Finance Committee to a close. The Finance Committee will be meeting tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. We'll have a discussion about the uh, one month budget over the, um, we have a couple of uh, days that we can do, a couple of meetings where we can do that, uh, but it will be before the council. And of course, uh, the council will have the opportunity to um, ask additional questions to the town manager at that time, since it is at a regular council meeting and uh, town manager is at council meetings. Uh, so that there is one more opportunity, unlike the um, region budget where I kept driving home the point that we made that might not have the opportunity to um, directly as counselors ask questions of the uh, superintendent, but we certainly can of the town manager. So have seen no other hands being raised um, either from uh, members of the uh, council and finance committee or members of the public I think that we can uh, conclude um, the hearing for this evening for the one month budget. And um, I wanna thank the town manager and uh, finance staff, uh, Mr. Mangano and Ms. Aldrich for uh, their participation this evening. And uh, um, that will enable us to um, adjourn the Finance Committee meeting, and I turn it over then to uh, President Griesmer to uh, conclude whether there's any additional business or whether she wishes to adjourn the council meeting. I just want to remind us that next week at 5.30, we have an information meeting about the capital budget. At, at 6 o'clock, we have the public forum, and at 6.30, we have our regular council meeting with a very, very full agenda. Other than that, meeting's adjourned. Thank you.